Hey biology students. In this video, we're going to talk about invertebrate animals. Do you remember the animal on the slide? That's right. This is a Christmas tree worm. However, if we use that word Christmas tree worm, is that the scientific name of this animal? No, that would be the common name. The scientific name of this animal is Spirobranchus giganteus. So spirobranchus would be the genus and giganteus would be the species. This would represent the scientific name. Now this animal is also segmented. Notice it has all of these little, little rings, and that's because it's a member of a phylum of invertebrates we'll learn about today called the Annelida. Annelida means little rings. Last time I showed you the phylogenetic tree of the kingdom Animalia. Now I want to show you one that's the same, but um, this one is organized from left to right instead of from bottom to top. So on this tree, we see, of course, the ancestral protist, the flagellate that's recognized as the common ancestor of all animals on this planet. So this would be the common ancestor of all animals. We recognize that this is an ancestral protist. And the name that's generally recognized is coanoflagellate. This protist was single-celled and it lived 600 million years ago. So this is the common ancestor of all animals. It was single-celled, but one of the features of being an animal is to be multicellular. So the quenoflagellate is not the first animal. So the first animal would have had to be multicellular, but it would, it would function and look very similar to quenoflagellates these flagellated single-celled protozoan organisms. So the first animal, the most ancient lineage of all animals on this planet is an invertebrate. And this animal is classified within the phylum periphera and it's a sponge. First animal, sponge. Sponges are interesting because they have no true tissues, no true movement, but under the microscope, they look a lot like protists. They're just protist cells that learn to cooperate and to organize into a multicellular organism. We'll talk more about the sponges on the next slide. Following the evolution of the sponges, we now have uh, more complex animals with true, true, true tissues and also true movement. Sponges are anchored to a rock or sand surface. So that's why we consider sponges, they really have no true movement. However, these next animals do have true movement and true nervous tissue. So here we're now going to classify the next groups of animals by their symmetry. So in the last video, we talked about symmetry radial symmetry, and bilateral symmetry. We also talked about germ layers. This refers to the layers that form during the gastrulation process in the embryo. These layers include the endoderm, the ectoderm, and the mesoderm. Some organisms are uh, triploblastic. Remember, that means they have all three of the germ layers. Others have two germ layers, and we call them diploblastic.
So what's an example of an animal that has two germ layers and has radial symmetry? That's right, these would be the cnidarians, like jellyfish. Now we're gonna further branch in the family tree. Now we're gonna further divide based on the process in embryonic development we talked about in the last video. This is the process for formation of the mouth versus the anal opening of the gastrointestinal tract. Remember, when that little gastrula folds in on itself, there's a pore. That pore is called a blastopore. If the blastopore becomes the mouth opening first, we call those animals protostomes. Those include arthropods, roundworms, annelids, mollusks, and flatworms. If the blastopore forms the anal opening first and then the mouth opening second, those animals are called deuterostomes. And there are only two groups that are deuterostomes. Those are the chordates, which we are a part of, as well as the echinoderms. So now we're gonna go through and discuss each of these categories of animals. Briefly, those of you who take the lab portion of this course, you'll be going into a little more detail as you proceed through the animal lab and watch some of the animal videos that are linked to that lab. Let's start by talking about the phylum periphera. What do we wanna remember about these? Well, these are sponges, most live in water, um, uh, fresh water or salt water, and they are what we call sessile animals. What that means is that they don't move. They're attached to a rock or a surface like uh, bottom of the ocean. So no true movement, although they are classified as animals. A lot of people might mistake them for being plants. We also recognize in the evolutionary history of life on Earth, these were the first animals. They evolved from their, from the most recent common ancestor we share with the protists, which is the coanoflagellates. So most sponges have a tube-like structure to their body, and they are filter feeders. The way they filter, uh, filter feed is that they have these microscopic cells here called coanocytes. A zoomed in image of a coanocyte is shown at the bottom. Notice the coanocyte has a flagellum. That flagellum is used for motility and it actually rotates like a tail, okay, but in a 360 degree motion, sort of like that, more like a motor than like a tail, more like a motor. And these are attached to a feeding cell here that we call the amoebocytes. So the amoebocyte is recognized as the feeding cell. Does that word amoebocyte sounds familiar to you? That's right, an amoebocyte sounds like an amoeba. And we learned about amoebas in the protist lecture. But remember, these sponges are most closely related to the animal-like protists. So it makes sense that we see a lot of similarities in body form. Recall, protists are all single-celled, although many of them have flagella, and all, all of, you know, there are some that are, that are amoebas as well. So what we think happened was that some of those protist, uh, protozoan cells, those animal-like protists, eventually began to cooperate in nature. They began to organize into the first animal body, which is the sponge body. So here we have some, some cell types that they're collaborating with each other. The way they're collaborating is that the coanocyte acts as the pumping cell. Let's write that here. So it's the pumping cell. And what it's gonna do, it's going to, it's going to rotate the flagella in a 360 degree motion and pump water through the body of the sponge. That process is called filter feeding. Filter feeding.
Let's watch that process in this animation. Actually, this is taken from under the ocean from a, a marine biologist who was studying sponges and she was studying the method that they used to eat. And what she does is she squirts some colored dye into the uh, water surrounding the sponge and then she observes how it feeds. So here she goes. She's going to do her experiment and release some fluorescent green dye into the surrounding water of the sponge. This is an enormous sponge. Some of them are really big. Some of them are smaller. There's thousands of different species of sponges. So now we're going to watch as the microscopic colonocytes do their job. Their job would be to pump like a little motor to push this water through the body of the sponge. And as that pushes the water, it's going to push plankton, another type of protist, towards the amoebocyte cells. And those amoebocyte cells are going to capture the plankton out of the water. This is why it's called filter feeding. So the water is being filtered for these microscopic plankton organisms that are used to feed the sponge. Pretty cool. So all that movement that you're seeing is a result of the microscopic work of this motor-like cell, this pumping cell that we call the coanocyte. And structurally, when we look at coanocytes, they look a lot like the common ancestor of all animals under the microscope. They look like the coanoflagellates. What else do I want to know? You, uh, want you to know from this diagram? Well, here in yellow, you see this little structure here. This is recognized as the skeleton of the sponge, and it's called a spicule. So, the original bath sponges that people used to use, and why we use that term sponge today, like kitchen sponge or bath sponge, actually comes from these these uh, animals. So when they die, they release their skeleton, and their skeleton is just composed of collagen that is very squishy, and um, these are also uh, called spicules. Okay, so this is composed of a protein we call collagen, which is the same protein that you find in your skin. Um, and this uh, leftover body of a sponge obviously can be used for cleaning. Here we're seeing a pore, the other label we could put in the diagram. Next, let's talk about the phylum Cnidaria. When you pronounce the word Cnidaria, the C is silent. The Cnidarians have two general body forms, or two what we call body morphologies. The morphologies are polyp and medusa. So, the polyp forms remind us a lot of sponges because they do attach to some sort of surface. So the animal has to attach, but it does have tentacles that do move and they do move around and capture their prey. Inside the animal, we see a gastrodermis um, or gastrovascular cavity. This is basically like the stomach. We also notice that it has one body opening. So the mouth and the anus are the same opening. So the function of the tentacles is to sting the prey, capture the prey, and push the prey into this opening here, into the gastrovascular cavity where digestion can occur. The medusa form is like the polyp upside down. The medusa word comes from Greek mythology. The woman in Greek mythology, the medusa, who had snakes for hair. 
So now the tentacles are pointed down, but the body structure is otherwise very similar. Where we have an internal gastrovascular cavity, we also have one body opening, mouth anus. This time though, the animal is trying to propel from the bottom into the mouth. These animals can reproduce sexually or asexually. Some of the animals are only medusa form throughout their life or polyp form. And then some cnidarians can have both types, both polyp and medusa in their life cycle. A good example of a cnidarian that is both a polyp and a medusa at different stages of its life is a jellyfish. Let's take a look at the life cycle of a jellyfish. Moon jellies begin their lives as tiny polyps anchored to the seafloor. They are ghostly forms of life, no larger than the tip of a pencil. Like so many cnidarians, they seem perfectly ordinary and perhaps unexciting until you look closely at their hidden lives. In fact, just a few times each year, moon jellies undergo one of the most fantastic transformations in the animal kingdom. At some point, those polyps, they'll begin to divide. And it's almost like they form little plates, one on top of each other. Each polyp forms dozens of orange plates. Each plate in turn becomes a single animal called an ephyra. The ephyra can be considered the juvenile jellyfish stage, each of which breaks off from the pulp stem and swims away. Millions of years ago, ancient cnidarians may have freed themselves from the sea floor in just such a way. Over the course of a month, the juvenile jellyfish feed on plankton as they develop into adults. Fully grown, they can reach nearly two feet in width. When they spawn, these jellyfish gather in massive swarms near the coast. Males cast threads of sperm into the water. Collecting the threads with their frilly arms, Females capture and ingest the sperm, which then fertilize their eggs. Okay, so let's review the life cycle of the jellyfish that you just observed in the video. So remember, cnidarians would be sharing a common ancestor with the sponges. So it makes sense that many animals in this category also are sessile, meaning that they are polyps that are attached to a surface like a rock. So the juvenile jellyfish um, forms as a result of sexual reproduction. So here we see two adult medusa forms. One is male and one is female. The males release the egg, release the sperm, and the uh, females either release the eggs or fertilization occurs internally. The zygote forms 
and then that develops into a larva covered in cilia hairs. That larva lands somewhere at the bottom of the ocean where it can grow into the polyp stage. The polyp is actually a colony, meaning that there's two types of these polyps. There's the reproductive polyps, and then there's also feeding polyps as well. The reproductive polyps will go forth and bud, as you saw in the video, and form little baby nubedusa. Now we have a word for that. We call those a phyra. So the, a phyra would be the juvenile jellyfish, the smaller jellyfish. And I think that is so amazing as they break off of these um, reproductive polyps, as we saw in the video there. And it really gives me a good idea of how this would have likely occurred millions of years ago in the oceans with some genetic diversity among these sponge ancestors where some of them had the ability to break off from the sessile form, okay, from the non-moving form of the animal body and break off and become something completely different, an animal that could move. So this is gonna represent a group of animals, the Cnidarians, the first animals to represent true movement in the animal kingdom. So what are some examples of Cnidarians? Well, besides jellyfish, pictured here, also little organisms called hydra. Hydra also comes from a Greek mythology term of the, um, the mythical creature that had multiple heads, multiple dragon heads, I believe. Yeah, so that's where the hydra term comes from. It's actually a very small little freshwater dwelling cnidarian. It lives in a lot of ponds and streams. It's just a couple millimeters in size. We usually look at them under the lab in the, in the Kingdom Animalia lab that we do in Bio 100. We also play with them because they are, um, uh, they're sensitive to touch. These tentacles are very sensitive to touch. That's how they, um, that's how they sense their prey is simply by uh, bumping up against their prey, which you may have accidentally noticed if you've ever been stung by a jellyfish. They don't seek you out when you're stung by a jellyfish. You accidentally bump into them and then they um, fire their venom into you. But next slide on that one, okay? Um, all right, so by the way, what body form is Hydra? of the two types of cnidarian forms. That's right, this would be a polyp. We know jellyfish do both. So jellyfish are polyp and medusa, different stages in their life cycle. How about this animal here? Yeah, if you've ever been to SeaWorld and put your hand in any of those little tide pool exhibits, uh, they have lots of these sea anemones that are another example of a cnidarian, and they also have these stinging um, tentacles. And the ones they put in the tide pools at SeaWorld where, you know, all the little kids stick their hands in there, um, those aren't the <laughs> particularly venomous kinds. Um, what happens is if you do stick your hand in the tide pool and you touch the tentacles of the sea anemone, it will stick to your fingers. It's really kind of eerie, but it doesn't hurt. It's not a painful sting, but you do notice that they are um, attaching to you what, and they are releasing a venom. However, it's such a low dose of the venom that you don't actually, your nervous system is not able to register it as pain. So you don't register it as pain, but if you were a small fish and you just got tangled up in um, the tentacles of an, of an, an anemone, um, yeah, you would feel it and you would be um, attached to the tentacles. And then once again, this is a body opening here. Let me circle it. This would be the one, it's the one stop shop body opening for the um, Cnidarians. And they would be pulling their food, in, their prey alive. So if this Cnidarian here caught um, a prey animal, like a small fish, it would grab it, paralyze it with its tentacles 
and then it would pull it into its mouth opening and then essentially it would push it into its stomach cavity which is called the gastrovascular cavity and digest the fish alive wow gets gets crazy doesn't it sea anemone by the way that's going to be a polyp body form how about these animals in the bottom a lot of people don't realize these are animals and they are they're cnidarians um they're uh, coral so coral is actually an example of um, what we call a symbiotic relationship in nature because there is an algae that lives in the tissues of the animal. Um, the animal also secretes the skeleton of the coral, um, but there is a cnidarian in there um, that uh, is a polyp. Let's put a little star there and add that little detail for you. So the coral is an example of something we call a symbiosis in nature. It means that there's a collaborative relationship between more than one organism in sort of a colonial fashion, a colony, okay, where they benefit each other um, mutually. So here, this is an example. It's a cnidarian animal plus an algae. So cnidarians get their name because of their stinging cells. Their stinging cells are called nidocytes, and it's nidocytes that contain um, a stinging venom within a, a little pocket called a nematocyst. Here's what those nematocysts look like. So within those tentacles we were talking about on the cnidarians, those tentacles are lined with these cells called nidocytes. And within there is a coiled up spring-loaded nematocyst. It's spring-loaded with even a trigger here. That trigger is motion sensitive. All you need to do is brush against the tentacle and it discharges the venom. So notice it's all coiled up here in the nematocyst. But once that trigger is touched by, um, it, it has to actually, um, physical, physical touch is actually going to trigger the release of the um, venom. So it's some little animal that just happens to bump up against the um, anemone or against the jellyfish, or it's a swimmer, you're out swimming in the ocean and you know, sometimes it's visibility is really low in the ocean. Those are the times when I've been stung is that visibility has been really low and I'm just out swimming. I really enjoy open water swimming in the ocean and um, as well as snorkeling and scuba diving. And, you know, if if you're doing that without wearing a wetsuit, you might accidentally run into a jellyfish. And what it feels like, it feels like um, like a burning sensation. Um, so the jellyfish we have here in San Diego are overall fairly harmless. I mean, it's painful. It's going to make a, a, a rash like this guy has here. Um, you know, you just want to you want to remove the jellyfish if it sticks to you. Uh, you want to use hot water. That hot water is going to help denature the protein of the venom that, that if you do feel it feels like a sunburn sort of rash feeling to it. Um, you can use hot water. Um, to uh, to stop the, the spread of the venom and the pain. Um, now, some jellyfish are very uh, venomous, and there are some in Australia, in particular the box jellyfish, is probably the most venomous jellyfish in the world. And if you are swimming, open water swimming in Australia, and you accidentally bump yourself into the box jellyfish, good luck, because that jellyfish can stop your heart with the venom. Okay, let's move on to the mollusks. Here we're seeing a whole bunch of different types. Now, one of the big highlighting features of the mollusks is that they have a shell. Although, the octopuses as well as the cuttlefish are in this category as well. And um, those don't have a 
a true shell. They have sort of a reduced shell, um, but they have the, uh, the same tissue, the cell type that other mollusks have that allow them to create the shell. So they are in this category, but um, they, they evolved from mollusks that had a defined shell, um, but through many uh, years of evolution, they have lost their shell and it's a very reduced um, part of their body, meaning that it's just, it's an internal shell. It's sort of strange. It's an internal, internal shell that's just like a single um, uh, structure, very small. Okay, so let's talk about further classification within the phylum mollusca. There's three classes I would like you to be aware of. So the first class is class gastropoda. And in class gastropoda, these would be um, the snails and the slugs. Now these uh, mollusks uh, get their name gastropoda, or sometimes just referred to as gastropods, because the stomach of this animal is right above their uh, foot. So the foot is called, um, uh, the word pod means foot. So this word actually literally translates to stomach foot. So if you've seen a snail move uh, along, say, a sidewalk, uh, you'll notice it leaves a slimy trail, right? Um, well, it's, it's actually moving along a structure we call the foot. And that is something that all of the um, all of our mollusks are going to have in common. So there are some shared traits that we see uh, within the phylum mollusca. So one of those traits is um, what we call a muscular foot. So this is a structure that it uses for movement. So in snails and slugs, it's it's right uh, below their their uh, stomach. So they're sort of sliding along on their um, on their stomach. Uh, the next class within the phylum is bivalvia. Uh, class bivalvia or the bivalves. Uh, that means two uh, two hinges. Okay. So think of these now as our our truly shelled animals here. Where we have two two halves, okay. And these would be things like clams, oysters, abalone, mussels. And then third class cephalopoda. So the cephalopods are actually highly intelligent animals. Um, they do have a brain and they are um, pretty remarkable in their intelligence as well as their strength, as well as some other really amazing adaptations of the octopuses, such as color changing skin where they can change the color and the texture of their skin to blend into their environments. So the word cephalopod means brain foot. Actually, you know what? So the word cephalopod means head foot. So they do have a defined head and it is attached to their muscular foot that they use for movement although they have um, eight uh, of those tentacles that they use for um, their muscular foot. So this would be octopuses, squid, and cuttlefish. Okay, let me tell you what else is a shared trait of the mollusks. So besides the muscular foot, they have another structure called the mantle. This is the tissue that they have that produces shells. And the third shared trait is something called a radula. The radula is a tongue structure used for feeding.
So these would be the shared traits of the mollusks. The muscular foot, the mantle tissue, which may or may not produce the shell, but you have to have at least have that tissue, and then the radula. Next in the evolution of life, we get several different groups of worms, different phyla of worms. So here you're seeing their scientific classification term. Um, in that opening um, uh, video or opening um, phylogenetic tree that I showed you, uh, I did give you their common name though, so let me give you that. So the phylum platyhelminthes, these would be the flatworms. That might be one of my favorite words in science. Platyhelminthes, that is so cool. That is a cool word. Say that one out loud. Platyhelminthes. Yeah, it's cool. It means flatworm. Uh, we usually see these ones under the microscope when we do the lab on the animals. And pictured here is a type of flatworm we call planaria. Planaria live in fresh water, and they're just a few millimeters in length, very small. Um, and you'll notice another a cool feature about these worms is they have a defined head. So you see that they do have a head and they do have eyes. Um, although they're not, um, uh, they're, they're actually photoreceptors. Basically they sense light and dark. They're a very primitive eye feature. So they're really not true eyes, but you definitely see that under the microscope. And they're, you'll never guess what their mouth is. <laughs> it seems like it would be on the head, wouldn't it? You know, the mouth is underneath their belly. So they have this funky little tube underneath their belly, and that's actually their mouth. Uh, planaria are used in, in research regularly. These are regenerative worms. They have some amazing regenerative pop, uh, properties. So they have the ability to regenerate of um, their body tissue really fairly fast and easy. So in the past, we've done experiments in the lab where you cut off their head and they regenerate their head. You can even, um, you can cut their head down the middle, like right between the eyes. You can cut it, just make an incision there. And you know what will happen in a few days? You'll get a worm with two heads. <laughs> so amazing regenerative properties. Um, lots of uh, researchers trying to understand the specific stem cells that these animals have that allow them to regenerate in amazing ways that we as humans don't have the ability to do. Okay, how about these worms down here? These are the annelids. And remember when we talked about the Christmas tree worm in the beginning of this lecture, I mentioned that the Christmas tree worm is an example of an annelid. Annelid means little rings. So these are worms that are segmented. So they have a segmented body. Do you recognize the worm here that's pictured as an example of an annelid? That's right, this is a leech. Leeches are also a pretty amazing group of worms. Of course, they do feed on blood and they secrete a powerful blood thinner called harudin. And that is oftentimes even still in modern day used as a blood thinner um, in hospitals. So um, historically people used to put leeches on their skin to because people thought that blood needed to be purified and you needed to release blood. And so back in the old days, their blood it was called blood letting and you would have leeches and you would just put them on your skin and let them feed on you. And that was thought to purify your, your blood, um, that's not the case, okay? That's not true. However, the, they do release a blood thinner and an anesthetic. So if you've ever been bitten by a leech, now these animals live in freshwater lakes and streams, and usually this is when you're, say, fly fishing or you're swimming in a lake and you're 
um, you don't know you don't even notice usually um, that you have a leech on you um, because when they bite they release an anesthetic that numbs the area so you don't actually feel that they're um, on you um, <laughs> uh, so in medicine, even in hospitals today, sometimes when they have a um, somebody with a blood clot, maybe a, a, they're in an accident and they have a mangled hand um, and they need to keep the blood flow circulating, they will actually bring in leeches into hospitals and um, still use them medically today. Who else is in this group? Well, earthworms would be another one to add here. And then lastly on the slide, we see the nematodes, also known as roundworms, because they have a round body shape. And these ones, many, many are actually parasites inside of animals, um, larger animals. It's a very primitive worm. And what's really unique about them as we move away from um, you know, cnidarians, and we, we actually see that these worms all have two body openings. So there is a separate mouth opening and a separate anal opening. And then basically it's just one big long tube inside of this worm that connects the mouth and the anal opening. And on a very basic level, that's how our digestive system works too. It's just one big long tube, okay, that starts at the mouth and then goes down the esophagus and to the stomach and to the uh, small intestine, to the large intestine, and it's all coiled up inside of you at about 30 feet worth of tubing that's inside of your body. Now let's learn about the echinoderms. These guys are really well um, show, documented in this little film, uh, taken from another marine biologist who studies them. Let's take a look. But then your mind might turn to, what is the thing doing? It's really hard to relate to what they're doing because it might not be moving fast, because it doesn't have a face. The major reason I study kinderms is that they are weird. strike. He wondered what their posturing meant and formed a simple and ingenious plan to discover just what the sea stars were doing. I put an ESA camera in the rocks to steady it, I'd pile rocks around it, and then I could leave the camera there. So when I use this time-lapse movie, then all of a sudden you take picture, 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 picture. And then when you're projected, they go very fast and I could finally see a sequence. So then I said, my God, this is what they're doing, you know, and this is how they behave. And it looked beautiful when it run at the fast speed. Enjoy that little movie about the um, sea stars because they do move very slow. Again, a lot of echinoderms can be mistaken for um, plants or flowers, but they actually are animals. They actually are invertebrate animals. And one thing they all have in common is um, they all have what we call five part symmetry. So think about a sea star that has five arms. Um, we definitely see some other uh, five-armed animals here, so sea stars, brittle stars here. Um, but now imagine with me that we take those five arms and you fold them in, you fold them in and make a little ball. Well, now we have another body form that's a sea urchin, which is another example of an echinoderm. And then take that little ball that represents the sea urchin and imagine sort of stretching it out. Well, now you've got this animal, which is also in the... Um, in the kingdom or in the phylum Echinodermata, 
and this would be a sea cucumber. Then there's some other ones. This one is called a feather star. And this one is called a sand dollar. So the word echinoderm means spiny skin. They are an example of a deuterostome, if you recall. They are an unusual group because there is no brain, there is no head, and in a way it seems like a step backwards in evolution. But they do have cooperative behavior, as you saw in that video, that documentation showing that they do interact with each other just on a much slower scale than the rest of the animal kingdom. As deuterostomes, they are also the most close relative to the chordates. And the chordates represent the phyla of animals that we belong to. So say hello to the echinoderms. The, you and the echinoderms share a, close, a closer evolutionary relationship than we do with any of the other invertebrates. Let's talk about the arthropods. The arthropods are a group of animals that learned how to live on land. So all of the animals we've talked about so far in the evolution of life in the animal kingdom, you might have noticed that they all live in water or are dependent on water. So the reason why we think the arthropod phylum was so successful is that this represents a group of animals that developed adaptations for survival on land. And these are the first animals to live on land. We think that their most common ancestor, <clears throat> most recent common ancestor of the arthropods was something similar to the horseshoe crab. So think about it, if you needed to be um, successful on land as an animal, where your ancestors all lived in the water and were used to moist body systems, you would need some adaptation that would allow you to breathe on land since all other animals have the ability to breathe in water. And so we see that in the horseshoe crab, this is an example of an arthropod that spends part of its life in the water and part of its life on land. And its ability to breathe air on land is a function of its book gills. So this group of arthropods, the first animals that moved onto land, they diversified into a number of different groups that have been wildly successful on Earth, representing more of any animal than any, any other example. So these include insects, including winged ant insects and beetles. This includes crustaceans like lobsters. Shrimp and crabs. This includes things like centipedes and millipedes. This includes things like arachnids. Were you startled by this picture of this guy here, the spider? So spiders and scorpions would be arachnids. So as you can see, that is a wide, widely diverse group within the phy phylum arthropoda and a very successful group. The word arthropoda means jointed appendage. So they all have these jointed appendages. So jointed legs. So besides the ability to breathe on land, which is a function of their book gills, they also have many other adaptations, just so many different types like wings, 
a rigid exoskeleton, which we see in lobsters and all the other crustaceans, with the function of trapping moisture inside of the body because we don't, um, we can live on land and we don't want to dry out on land. So the exoskeleton not only does it protect it from predators, but it traps moisture for the animal. Um, other things like complex eyes and the spider. So lots and lots of adaptations within this phylum.